We are in the middle of a series called The Bible, A Unified Story Leading to Jesus. We stole the name of the series from The Bible Project, so highly recommend you check out The Bible Project's resources, podcasts, videos, even as we go through this series. This graphic we stole from Christianity Today. Now, I would say this graphic is average, and when it comes to its, its, art, its artistry, its creativity, this is like an average-looking graphic, whereas the graphic I made is incredibly better. I know I, <laughs> the bottom right part is above average, but everything else, uh, it, well, I make fun of my graphic because it's so easy to read from where you're sitting. I know that. I know it's so easy to read and to follow along where we're going. So you probably thought our graphic of our timeline couldn't be improved. You probably thought that's the perfect graphic ever made. We were able to improve it. Look at this. Boom. We're adding a star today to tell you where we are in the timeline. Amen. God is at work. Covenant established between God and his people is at the top. I do not have time, trust me, to catch you up on where we've been. If you missed it, go online and catch up on all the sermons. But uh, today's sermon, we have a lot to cover. Uh, we have a lot of new people here. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I cannot promise you today is going to be an inspirational boost to your life, uh, you know, to your, your, your inspirational boost that you need for your week. Uh, but this is so important, the stuff we're going to talk about in understanding how to read the Bible. Uh, the, you know, if, if you don't know how to read the Bible, it can be like a loaded weapon. You, you give someone the Bible that's new to faith or examining God, or maybe you've experienced this before, and you, you're reading about why are they slaughtering animals? Why are they sprinkling blood? Like, what kind of weird cult is this, right? Like, if we don't know how to read the Bible, the Bible can be a very, a very damaging thing. And so uh, today we're going to talk about some of the ways that we've gone off trail when we don't read the Bible the way it was intended uh, to be read and how we can hold God to promises he didn't make. So that was your second discussion question. We often, as New Testament church Christians, hold God to promises he never made to us. And that can also be very damaging to our lives as well as to, uh, to the church itself. So the graphic continues to get better if that could, would even be possible, I know. Uh, but I have highlighted this red part of the timeline as what we would call the Old Covenant, or you might hear it called the Sinai Covenant. That's Mount Sinai, not cyanide, uh, the poison. Sinai, the name of a mountain. And uh, you might also hear it called the Mosaic Covenant. No relation. We're not related. You know, it's just, just a, uh, Mosaic as in Moses. We are Mosaic as in, look at our banner. We have actually a definition. You can read of Mosaic now. That's awesome. Um, but there's two covenants in the Bible. There's a, there was an old covenant made with God and his people, and then there's what's called a new covenant that you see in light blue. And it's, I, I think this is, the number one, uh, this is the number one Bible reading tool that you need to know when you read your Bible, is the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And we're going to explain why. Now, we don't use covenants a lot today. We don't use that language a lot. You might use the word covenant when talking about marriage. One person making a covenant with another. They're committed to one another. They make vows. Uh, there's, there's, there's two sides of a covenant that they're going to keep together. I think a helpful illustration is a landlord contract. So a landlord contract, it's not really a covenant. We don't use that language. But it's similar to one in that both sides of a landlord contract have a role to play. Now, if I'm renting from a landlord and my landlord contract, I would have a piece of paper that I sign and I put my name on it. And if my landlord contract said no cats or I get evicted, then that'd be very sad for me because these are my two cats and I have no problem uh, being a, a man. I'm not turning my man card in and admitting that I love cats. I do. I have two of them and I would be in trouble because these are my cats and if I had a landlord contract that said no cats or you get evicted, that's what I signed on to, I'd have to have no cats in my house. Now, if I went over to Dennis's house and let's say Dennis had cats in his house and I said to him, Dennis, you can't have cats in your house. And I pull out my landlord contract and I say it says right here in my landlord contract that you can't have cats in your house or you get evicted. What would Dennis have every right to say to me, 
<laughs> besides meow. He would say, that's not my contract. That's, I have a different one. And he'd, he'd pull his out and he'd say, no, my landlord says I can have cats. It's fine. We might even have the same landlord. We might have the same landlord, but we have two different contracts, one that allows cats and one that doesn't. Very important that we would follow the landlord contract that we signed our own name to. We're going to get to Exodus 24 in a few minutes, and we're going to see where the Old Testament people of God signed their name, so to speak, to a contract with God. And it is a different contract, a different covenant than the one that we are under. So, here we go. Uh, the word land is in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is your fifth book of your Bible. Uh, any guesses? Any guesses? I don't have it on my notes, so you can't look back and cheat. Any guesses on how many times the word land is in the book of Deuteronomy? If you if you've went to seminary or if you are a pastor in this room, you are not allowed to answer. Zip it. All right. How many times is the word land in the book of Deuteronomy? 28. Any more? Any other guesses? 37. 50 what? 57. More. Any more? 100. 52. 46. 2. 77. Okay, you're all wrong. You're all way wrong. 197 times. 197 times. Okay, so we're going to do a little exercise. We're all, we're going we're gonna to say the word land 197 times. Okay, ready? Land, 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 land. I'm just kidding. Wouldn't that be horrible if we did that? 197 times? <laughs> like, this is insane. Why are we saying the word land so much? The readers of Deuteronomy would have said the same thing. The word land is in the book of Deuteronomy 197 times. You think it's important? Yes. And it's really specific. Because if I say land, your next question should be, which land? Which land? This land? The gymnasium we're standing on? Grand Rapids, Michigan? The United States? North America? No. To all of those. The land is what is today the country of Israel. That's the land. The land is a specific track of land in the Middle East called Israel. Now, this rent contract between God and the Old Testament people is very, very, very specific. It's a very specific contract. If you, in your free time, read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, which reader discretion is advised. Uh, do not read these to your children. Uh, do, kids leaders, do not teach these in our kids' uh, ministries. These two chapters, they're similar because Leviticus 26 is the law. Leviticus 28 is a, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 28 is a repeat of the law. It is specific blessings and curses of the land contract. So I talked about if I had a rent contract, no cats, or you get evicted. That was what this covenant was between God and his people. And I'm telling you that this is some of the most brutal scripture in the whole Bible when it comes to if you disobey this covenant, this is what's going to happen. And it's gruesome. Like, I was going to quote some of it, and I got too queasy. Like, I can't. As a, as a parent of children, I can't even read some of this out loud in a sermon. But what's crazy about our timeline is that you take Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, they're very similar, and it, it's, it's, it, it's basically saying, if you obey, if you obey this covenant, this contract that God and his people made, there's going to be blessings. And the blessings all had to do with land. Okay, it was really important in the ancient world. In the ancient world, we're talking 1400 B.C., 1200 B.C. We're, we're talking up to 1000 B.C. with David. Where, where in the ancient world, if you had big crops, if you had an army that could keep your people at peace in a very barbaric world, if you weren't getting sick from plagues, what it meant was your God was real. What it meant was your people were a light to the other nations. People would say, well, look at Israel. Look at the blessing of God on their land. But if Israel were to disobey, if they were to go against God's, uh, God's commands and the law, there would be curses. And the curses are brutal. Now, I say equals lamentations because if you go later in your Bible to the book of Lamentations, you see Israel did lose their land. And the whole book of Lamentations is a lament 
A lament is a, a prayer of crying out in brutal agony for pain. This pain was specific to this covenant that the Israelites broke. They broke it primarily because of idolatry. They worshiped other gods and injustice, not caring for the poor, not caring for the oppressed. These are things that God cares very, very much about. Now, let me tell you this. We do not want that contract. This is why it's important for you to know how to read your Bible. We don't want that contract. We don't, we, you might say, well, I'd like the blessings if I do it the right way. You do not want those curses in Leviticus 28 and uh, 26 and Deuteronomy 28 to apply to you. We live in a totally different world today. To be a light to the nations looks very different than it did in the ancient world. And we are not in a God-nation relationship. We're going to talk a little bit more about that too. But God's relationship with the United States is nothing, nowhere, even close to what there is relationship to ancient Israelites, ancient Hebrews, the ancient Jews uh, was written out in the Bible. Now, last thing. So some of you that are like ner nerdy Bible nerds, academic nerds, you're going to like this. Others are going to start falling asleep. Go get a refill of coffee. We have the cart in the bag. Uh, stay with me. Okay. Suzerain vassal covenant is what God signed with the people of Israel. Like, what is that? I don't know what that is. Well, the people of Israel would have known what that was. A Caesarean vassal covenant was a common covenant of the day. And uh, we would call it uh, today like a, a big king, little king covenant. That's a way of understanding it. So in the ancient world, I mean, if you know anything about ancient history, these nations were always conquering each other. And things were always shifting from the Egyptians to the Assyrians to the Babylonians and the Persians. They were always conquering one another. And there was a lot of these little nations that were under the shadow of the big nations. Israel was one of them. And if a big king came to a little king and said, I'm going to attack you. I want your land. The little king had two choices. Guess what they were? One, be wiped out by the big king. Just be completely annihilated. And we have lots of historical evidence of that. The second option was sign a suzerain vassal covenant. And what a suzerain vassal covenant meant for the little king was, number one, they had to follow the big king's law. So they got a law from the big king. A lot of the first five books of the Bible we call the law because it's God, the big king's law, being given to Israel, the little king, saying, follow this law. But the little king got a lot in return. Number one, they got to live. Can we say amen to living, right? <laughs> That's a good thing, right? They got to live. And in, in their living, they had to obey these laws, and the big king would protect them. The big king would protect them. So Israel did not sign a suzerain vassal covenant with Egypt or with Babylon. They signed it with Yahweh. They signed it with God himself so that the other nations would look at them and say, don't mess with Israel because they have a really big bodyguard. And his name is Yahweh. Yahweh is the name God gives for himself in the Old Testament. All right, this was a conditional covenant. Signing it was, was a way of saying this covenant is conditional. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, this is conditional. If we do our end of the, of the bargain, we will be protected. If we don't do our end of the bargain, all bets are off. All right, so here we go. Back to our timeline. I'm telling you, this is the story of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is two-thirds of your Bible. If you want to know how to read two-thirds of your Bible, you've got to understand covenant. Now, if you go all the way back to Abraham, we had this unconditional promise of land, and we talked about the Hebrew word zerah, which means seed or offspring. And it was in Genesis like 42 or 48 times, something like that. This, this huge promise of God that Abraham was going to have this seed and these descendants and a land. If you go up in the timeline a little bit, Israel gets their land with Joshua. We're going to talk about that next week. Israel gets the promised land that God promised them. Galatians 3.16 in the New Testament tells us that they get their zerah, they get their seed in Jesus. Jesus is actually the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, of descendants. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Okay, uh, you, you see this from Joshua, which is around where, uh, a little bit after the Red Star, um, and if you go up through the Old Covenant, there's these warnings over and over and over again from the prophets. When you read Isaiah, when you read Jeremiah, when you read Amos, when you read all of the minor prophets, what you're reading are warnings to the people of Israel. And you know what the warnings were saying? Obey the covenant. You sign the covenant. If you want your land to be blessed, obey the covenant. 
They weren't obeying the covenant. Idolatry and justice. So you know what the prophets were saying? You're going to lose your land. You're going to lose your land. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be bad. Repent, repent, repent. Come back to God. He's your source of life, not these idols. He's your source of life, not these idols. Can we relate to that today? Yes. God is our source of life, not these idols. We have to understand this is what's happening when we read the prophets. It leads up to what's called the exile. The prophets were right. The people didn't obey. And if you know Daniel and the lion's den, if you know Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, these stories happened within the exile and post-exile. We'll do a whole sermon on that. But they lost their land. They went from modern-day Israel to modern-day Iraq. Long, long way away. They lost their land. This is the story of the Old Testament. But there's a consistency. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were to be a light to the world. They didn't do it well. And so you, you continue forward. Uh, you see this new covenant being established. There's a tabernacle. We're not going to have time to talk about the tabernacle, but it was meant to be this dwelling place of God. It was meant to be a new Garden of Eden. It was meant to be a new place where God's people were a light to the world. Then they had a temple. It was meant to be the new place to be a light to the world. And then Jesus came, and Jesus was the way to be the light to the world. And you know what Jesus and the New Testament authors say where the temple is now? Point to yourself. You are the temple. We are the temple. You, actually a follower of Jesus, are a temple to be a light to the nations. So you can see the consistency in Scripture of what this mission is supposed to be. Okay, now we're going to jump into Exodus itself. Uh, this is Exodus 24. And if Exodus 19 through 24, Moses just gave them what we would call the Book of the Covenant. It's kind of the main chapter headings of the law. So they've heard the law. And this is where they're going to sign their rent contract. So I'm going to read it, and as I read it, I want you to follow along, and then pay attention to that last line uh, that, that I have highlighted in, in verse 8. It says, when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord had said, we will do. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood, and he put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. So he's splashing blood on the altar, representing this is, this is God's side of this covenant. He said, then he took the book of the covenant, and he read it to the people. He read them the law, and they responded, quote, we will do. Everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Moses then took the blood. He sprinkled it on the people. I'm glad we don't do that anymore because that's weird. Uh, he, but that's, that's, he sprinkled it on the people as their side of the covenant and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. God signing the rent contract. The Israelites are signing the rent contract. Where have you heard that phrase in yellow before. Does that ring a bell? This is the blood of the covenant. This is blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant. Fast forward to the New Testament. Now we have Jesus. This is 1,400 years later. The disciples are having the Last Supper, the Passover meal. Jesus holds up a glass of wine and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. It is an exact quote, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. You've got to ask at this point, what is going on in the disciples' heads? The t disciples that are with Jesus at the Last Supper. They would have been very confused. When Jesus says, this is the blood of my covenant, they would have said, no, it's not. The blood of your covenant was back in Exodus 24. That was the blood of the covenant. Number two, this is the Passover meal. Josh preached on that last week. Jesus is saying, I'm poured out for the forgiveness of many sins. And the disciples are saying, we're say, we're, our sins are forgiven by the Day of Atonement. Our, our, we, were, we were delivered on Passover by the blood over our doorposts. What blood are you talking about? He hadn't died yet. Jesus was going to die on the cross the next day. The disciples had no clue. 
We, we look at the disciples like they're faith heroes, and they are. But they were clueless. If you ever feel like you're clueless in your faith and in your walk, you're in good company. The disciples were clueless, and God still used them to do great things. Amen? Isn't that good uh, to be reminded of that? In Luke's rendition of the Last Supper, the same quotes from Jesus, uh, he, he writes in here that Jesus picks up the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the line Paul repeated in 1 Corinthians 11 when he tells the church, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus also said that. And I'm telling you, the disciples would have been really confused right now, but this is, this is the church ordinance. This here is, is what Paul tells the church to do. To, and, and, say, and when saying that, he's saying, this is the most important thing for you to remember. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. This is the new covenant. 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 What does new mean? New means a different new rent contract that we have with God. And we're going to see in a few minutes, it's a fulfillment of the old one, but it is a new one. And their whole understanding of their relationship with God was around covenant. That's hard for us to understand because our relationship with God, we think, is around hopefully the cross, the empty tomb, his presence with us. Their whole paradigm of their relationship with God was around that covenant. And now Jesus is like, I got a new one. Like, whoa, whoa, I, we, I don't know if we're ready for this. And they weren't all ready for it. They, they weren't all ready for it. We're going to get to that a little bit too. Okay, so back to our timeline. We have light blue here showing where the new covenant is. But you'll notice in the middle, right in the middle of the red line, we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah is underlined in light blue to represent uh, where things were at when God started talking about the new covenant. So at this point in Jeremiah, uh, the middle of the timeline, the people had already lost the land of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, was already gone to the Assyrians. They were already in exile. They had two tribes left, and it was the southern tribes, and Judah was one of them where Jerusalem is. And Jeremiah is saying, yo, you guys are going to lose this too. Repent, repent, repent. They're in the middle of seeing their whole nation crumble. Remember how many times land was written in Deuteronomy? Anyone remember? 197, that's right, 197. You got to think, like, if you're a teacher or a parent and you finally got your kids to figure out this, like, 197 times of land, you'd be so thrilled. And then you just show up the next day and they've set the whole thing on fire. It's like this dumpster fire. And you're like, no, you finally figured it out. And now it's all crumbling away. That's what's happening in Jeremiah. The old covenant disagreement, it was failing. They were losing the land because think about how hard it was to get to the promised land. You have the 10 plagues. You have the 40 years in the wilderness. You had to have the conquest. You had all these stories of the Bible, and it's all being flushed down the toilet right now. So what are you thinking at this point if you're an Israelite? It's all going down the toilet. What would you be thinking? All you know is this covenant. You'd be going, oh, no. God has abandoned us. God has rejected us. He has abandoned us. We're being put in another country that's not our own. We've, lost, we've messed up. We blew it. You ever felt that way? The Old Testament is full of God's grace. Let's talk about that for a moment as well. Let me throw that in there. So God, in his infinite grace, does Israel this huge solid, and in the middle of Jeremiah, he starts talking 600 years before Jesus about this new covenant that's coming. 600 years before Jesus, we have Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. All right, I told you, we, I told you this was a train. We got, we're, this is so, so, so important. Okay, read with me. We're in Jeremiah, 600 years before Jesus. Scripture says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant, red, that's the old one, I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand uh, to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. Well, that's deep right there. That's marriage talk. They cheated on me. That's a metaphor we see in the Old Testament, declares the Lord. This is the covenant, the new covenant, I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. So you see this shift happening from the law, which was written in stone and then in scroll, and the law is shifting from a 
stone or a scroll law into something that's inside of us, something that is in our hearts. This is a huge thing 600 years before Jesus ever held up that glass of wine. Could you guess, in the New Testament, they quote the Old. Can you guess what the longest quotation from the Old Testament is that we find in the New Testament? This one. In the book of Hebrews, which is post-Jesus, this is during the church, the first Christians, the book of Hebrews quotes this entire passage verbatim in Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 12. And then it repeats it again two chapters later. It quotes all of this in Hebrews, and then this is the next verse. By calling this covenant new, so we fast forwarded 600 years, we're post-Jesus now, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, when we hear obsolete, we think of trash, we think of, an out, we think of a VCR. Anyone still rocking a VCR? Yeah, I got one, I got one. Yeah, we think that outdated, right? Like, we're going to toss this thing. We're going to, that's outdated, you know? I don't need an answering machine anymore. I have a cell phone now. Uh, that's not what this means. Jesus, when, when he was teaching about the law, he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, like to get rid of the law, to get rid of the old covenant. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, but to fulfill them. And scripture, the book of Hebrews actually kind of describes it like this. Um, on the left here, we have some blueprints. And the transition from the Old Covenant to the New, from the Old Testament law to what we have in Jesus, and the Old becoming obsolete, it's like, a, it's like a blueprint of a house. A blueprint is very important to building a house, isn't it? It's very, very important. If you don't have a blueprint, good luck building a house. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was the blueprint to build the house. The house is Jesus. What's the title of our series? A Unified Story pointing to Jesus. Once the house is built, the blueprint is obsolete. The blueprint has done its job. But you don't throw the blueprint away. You can learn about the house from the blueprint. When something's going wrong in the house, you can pull out the blueprint, right? You can learn about the builder by looking at the builder's blueprint. So there's this beautiful relationship that one was designed to bring the other, and you keep the blueprint. I think often we think of this as if the old covenant was a blueprint, and then the new covenant was a new blueprint. So throw out the bad one, and we get a new shiny blueprint. That's not the relationship of the two. The blueprint brought the house. But also, while the blueprint is really important, and we can learn a ton from it, from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, it would be a tragedy if we thought that the blueprint was the final product, right? If we thought the blueprint was the house and, and, and we just thought, this is it, we've arrived, this is our covenant, and we tried to live under a blueprint, we kind of stretched it out, come here, fam, let's all cover up under this blueprint, it's a house, it's just not the way God designed. To miss Jesus would be to miss the whole purpose of the whole Old Testament story, okay? All right, so, man, Hebrews, I gotta say, please read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 for your homework. Um, I'm already out of time, and I'm trying to just give you this flyover of Hebrews. Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 is a better sermon than what you are hearing this morning. It lays almost all of this out in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. Please read it. Uh, here's a couple sections to get this blueprint language uh, going. The high priests, these are Old Testament offices that they had in the New Testament still. Uh, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. So when they're conducting the law, it's a copy and a shadow of what's actually in heaven, what's real. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern, that's a blueprint, shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Skip down to Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands that was only a copy of the true one. So the old sanctuary, the temple, the tabernacle, it's a copy, not the real thing. The law is only a shadow of the realities themselves, Hebrews 10 says about the law. So you get the idea. You get the idea of the blueprint being pointing towards the thing that is real, the thing that is in heaven. Now, uh, where is this all going? Trust me, we're going we're gonna to land this plane. Uh, this, this 
This is the number one thing we need when it comes to reading our Bible. This is the number one thing we need when it comes to reading our Bible. Um, back to Hebrews 8 in our, in our quote here about, the, about it being obsolete. The good news in this is the land curses of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 don't apply to you. They're obsolete. They don't apply to you. But neither do the land blessings. Okay, this is where in your, your discussion time, I asked you to talk about someone holding you to a promise you never made to them. This is where we get off kilter theologically. And this is everywhere. Like You'll hear, you'll hear this with really famous preachers, best-selling books, and, and there's disagreements on this, and we can have room to disagree, and we can talk and kind of, you know, strength sharpen each other in this. Um, but we hold God to promises he never made. When we take the blessing language of the Old Testament for that land over there, and we say, hey, if you follow God, then that's going to happen to you. Like, if you're a gardener and you grow cucumbers or you grow daffodils, and, and you're like, man, your cucumbers are looking great this year. Yeah, it's because I've been going to church. Yeah, you know, I've been reading my, reading my Bible, you know, listening to some podcasts. and my Check out my tomatoes over there. Yeah, I got those when I started reading my Bible every day, right? Uh, that's what we do. And that, I mean, that, that is not the promise that God made to us. But obviously, the garden thing is a joke. Uh, it has way more consequences than that in, in our life, So, which I th I th we're going to get to. Um, let me show you this, this verse, which is a great verse. I'm not saying don't enjoy this verse. I'm not saying... Uh, don't use this verse as encouragement in your faith. But this is in 2 Chronicles 7. This is Old Testament. And in verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will hear their land. Does the United States need to repent of sin? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. If we were to repent of sin, would it do good things? Yes, because anytime there's not sin around, Good things are going to happen, right? Like wholeness and flourishing and in the sense of, of God's design. But this is a major problem. We're going to talk about why. If we think that this specific promise applies to the United States of America. And here's why. One, you just go back one verse. This is the same passage. And we, we read, and we get a very different feel of the, verse, the, the section. It says, when I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land. Or send a plague among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Gives it a different feel, doesn't it? It gives it a different vibe to how we would interact with the scripture. So the problem is, I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans a few years ago. One of these, and I, I won't quote them, I don't even remember who it was, but one of those televangelists, uh, one of those televangelists, who like to say really horrible things, uh, I think just to make headlines, said, Hurricane Katrina is God's judgment on New Orleans for all of her sins, right? Quoting something like this. Um, think about, one, how damaging and horrible that is if you are a citizen of New Orleans, right? And, 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 but if that were true, think about the constant fear all of us would be living under, right? If that were true of the United States of America. If it were, I mean, we wouldn't even be here, right? Like, we're probably one of the most sinful nations that's ever existed. We already have been like Noah's Ark right off the map. If this covenant were true for us, praise God that it isn't. But check it out. Like, if you have cancer and you believe this is true for us today, well, then you're, you got your cancer because you sinned. And people believe that. If you struggle with infertility, someone will come up to you and say, you're going to get pregnant. All you have to do is have more faith. All you have to do is pray. All you have to do is rustle up some obedience. And if you do, God will bless you. That is a horrible way to live before God. That's called legalism. That's the law. That's this idea that Romans 8.1 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it says there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. All of what I just said, New Orleans, the cancer example, infertility example, that is all condemnation. That's all condemnation. And it all comes from living out of the wrong covenant. That's not our contract. And there's a lot more to get to that I'm, I'm already on negative time. We, we, we hopefully can talk about more. We're going to do a series next year on why do bad things happen. We're going to talk about more 
of this stuff, and we'll, we'll dive back into some of this. But worse, oh, another example is when a country believes this is true of them, they, they go out, and, and the, uh, the European colonizers did this. They had manifest destiny, and they colonized other lands. And what colonized meant was, I'm going to put a sword to your neck, and if you don't accept Jesus, I'm going to slit your throat, and we're going to take over your land. And that's what they did. They did that to Mexico. They did that to Native Americans here in the United States. They did it in Africa. They did it in South America. I mean, this was their belief was that these were their promised lands. These were their promised lands. No, these were not their promised lands. There's only one promised land, and it's over in Israel, and there's raging debate about how much of that first covenant applies to today anyway, and I'm not going to get into that. But it is safe to know that, uh, that, that these are not anyone's promised lands, that this direct application of this blessing and curse about if you repent or not does not apply to our country or those countries because those were not, they didn't make that covenant. They never made that rent contract with God. All right, lastly, health and wealth theology. If you've never heard that before, I think this is one of the main ways that we hold God to promises that he never made. And the idea is, uh, if you're a good Christian, if you come to church, if you give a lot in the offering plate, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, come on, give a little more, sow a seed of blessing, and God will bless you. I wonder who benefits from that the most. Um, you get the idea. It's buying into this old covenant as if it applies to us today, that you'll be healthy and wealthy if you obey Jesus. So if you're not healthy today and you're not wealthy today, what are you thinking? God hates me. <laughs> like, like God's hand is against me. No, it's not. You're in the new covenant. You're in the new covenant. You don't have to live under that oppressive legalism, which is a form of slavery. Paul calls the law slavery. And there's a whole, a whole other, you can go get PhDs on that. Okay, but just know that we cannot hold God to promises he didn't make to us. God didn't promise us the things of the land. And can we praise him that he didn't? Because we'd be under the curse as well. And we do not want that. We got Jesus who's way, way, way better. And I'm going to, I think I'm almost done. I think I'm almost done. Okay, I'm not going to read these because you can read them. Uh, oh, the, the last one shows the raging debate in the first century. There were people that said, that these non-Jews can't even be Christians. They have to become Jewish, follow the law to become a Christian. And the disciples in Acts 15 said, no. No, that's not true. They just need Jesus. Uh, but this is why, you guys, if you want to know those weird verses like, don't eat shrimp, don't eat lobster, don't wear mixed fibers, anyone wearing polyester, anyone wearing spandex, uh, anyone wearing anything mixed together, it says you can't trim the sides of your beards, right? We'd all be in trouble, you know? I mean, I was going to make a joke to Mark, Hannah, but let him know I thought of him when I when I mentioned that he's not here. So Mark's Mark's wife Hannah's back here. Mark's got a giant beard. He'd be okay. I think he'd be he'd be following the law. The rest of us would be in trouble. Um, all that through the old covenant. Praise God, we don't have to follow that. Now, um, yeah, I don't have time to get into this. I just don't have time to get into this. But worship team, come back up. Worship team, come back up. Um, what I want to say is this, the, the, uh, as they're coming back up, you guys can, you guys can start playing, Jake. Um, we're going to move into a time of communion. This was the response, by the way, uh, the apostles in Acts 15 when some Christians were saying, you need to become a, a Jew, you need to follow the law. And they said, no, you don't. You only need Jesus. We're saved by his grace. Uh, I, I want you to know, again, we don't have time to flesh this all out. We still follow the Old Testament we follow Jesus' interpretation of the Old Testament law. So Jesus interpreted the Old Testament law for us. The apostles interpreted the Old Testament law for us. I know it feels confusing, but we don't throw it out. It just means we understand it as a unified story leading to Jesus. We, we understand it like we would our favorite movie. So back to your favorite movie and your discussion time. If we throw out the Old Testament and we say, all I need is Jesus, I'll skip to the end of the story. Think about how much you miss about your favorite movie. Oh, I know who the hero is. I know how it ends, so I'm good. You miss out on all of the conflict. You miss out on all of the character development, and you miss out on the anticipation. Guys, God was waiting and waiting and waiting, and the people of God, the prophets, they are waiting in anticipation. When will the Messiah come? When will the Messiah come? 
Advent is coming. Christmas is coming. We're a month away. And the season of Advent is a time to go, when will the Messiah come? When will the Messiah come? That's the whole Old Testament. When will Jesus come? And guess what, friends? He came. He came. And we get to receive him. We get to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, the God of the universe coming in the flesh to be your friend, to be my friend, to save you from your sins, to save me from my sins.